Hello humans, welcome to another episode of Fuzzy Math, where we explore the curious phenomena of mental arithmetic and why it seems to be getting fuzzier by the day. I'm Jason, today we're going to be diving deep into the world of numbers, brains, and why sometimes they don't seem to mix. I'll also explore tips and techniques to boost your mental arithmetic. Now I can't promise that any of you will become like mental arithmetic geniuses here, but with a little bit of everyday practice, you really can boost your math skills, which can help in everyday life. Now I want you to picture this. You're sitting at a restaurant with friends and the bill arrives and it's time to calculate the tip. But instead of confidently crunching the numbers in your head, you reach for your phone, which has a calculator. So you're embarrassed by your sudden mental block. Does this sound familiar to you? Because it certainly has happened to me. Don't worry, you're not alone. Today, we're gonna to talk about mental math and why it seems to be a struggle for so many of us despite living in an age of unprecedented technological advancement. Now, to understand why mental math can be such a challenge for many of us, we need to take a trip back in time to our evolutionary roots. Throughout much of human history, our ancestors relied on basic arithmetic skills for survival, whether it was calculating the number of animals needed for a hunt or dividing resources among a tribe, mental math was a crucial tool for everyday life. And research has shown that our brains are wired to perform certain types of calculations very quickly and very efficiently, which is a trait that likely evolved to help our ancestors navigate their environments more effectively. However, when it comes to more complex calculations, our brains rely on a different set of processes that can be slower and more error prone. For example, everybody can visualize two rabbits plus three more rabbits, or it's pretty easy to have a mental picture of 10 ears of corn divided up among five people. But anything beyond simple mental images like this seems to be hard for many of us, including me. The concept of a decimal, for example, is a human invention. We can understand that 2.5 means two and a half, but that invention of the decimal point is not a natural thing. It could be any other symbol. So when humans begin doing calculations with decimals and fractions, it gets difficult because we can't hold the parts in our head at the same time to do the calculation. It is, however, a skill that can be practiced just like playing ball. Let me give you another concrete example. We all know from physics that we can calculate using the equations of motion the trajectory of any ball that is thrown, or a rock or a branch, in gravity, right? It goes up, it makes an arc, and it comes back down, right? We can calculate exactly where the ball will be at any point in the future as a function of time, right? We could also drop something, and we can calculate exactly where it's going to be uh, at any moment in time after we drop it. Even including air resistance, we could get very accurate with those calculations. However, if three years old and four years old, you're able to throw a ball and learn how to catch a ball, but you have no idea how to calculate anything in relation to physics at that age. That's because in our brains, we have a neural network which is optimized for certain kinds of calculations. If someone throws a ball at me, I can tell by the angle of the throw and by the force and by a bunch of other variables that I don't consciously actually understand, but I can internalize, I can guess where my hand needs Needs to be, and all of that is very, very fast without using mathematics. Somehow, we're able to predict the future without doing complex math. That is an evolved calculational technique. So, we obviously can do calculations in a different form than the written math that we learn how to do later. The downside is that it's, uh, it's not quite as accurate. So, we can catch a ball, but sometimes we fumble the ball. Calculating the motion with physics is much, much more accurate, but it takes longer to do. So it's a learned technique is what I'm trying to tell you. Simple arithmetic addition, subtraction, we can visualize. When you get to decimals, fractions, and on into more advanced math, it can get more difficult. But it is a skill that we can all practice and get better at. From calculators and smartphones to spreadsheet software and online banking apps, we now have access to powerful computational tools that can handle even the most complex calculations very, very easily. Now, while these technological advancements have undoubtedly made our lives easier in many ways, 
they also have had a profound impact on our numerical abilities. Studies have shown that the more we rely on technology to perform calculations for us, the more our mental math skills seem to deteriorate. It's a classic case of use it or lose it as our brains become increasingly reliant on external devices to do the heavy lifting. And if you're not sure if this is true, you just ask any student of algebra. You know, in the beginning, it seems really, really difficult. Eventually, you kind of get the hang of it, and then it doesn't seem so hard. So the same thing with our mental arithmetic. If you force yourself to practice a little bit each day, you will become better. Now let's talk a little bit about cognitive biases and mathematical anxiety, which is a huge roadblock for a lot of people. It's not just a lack of practice that can hamper our ability to do mental arithmetic. Psychological factors such as cognitive biases and mathematical anxiety can play a significant role in our numerical abilities. Cognitive biases are mental shortcuts that our brain uses to process information very quickly, but they can also lead to judgment error, particularly when it comes to mathematical reasoning. For example, the available heuristic is a type of cognitive bias that helps us make fast, but sometimes very incorrect assumptions. It involves relying incorrectly on information that comes to mind quickly or is most available to us, and it causes us to overestimate the likelihood of events that are easily recalled from memory, leading to errors in probability calculations. Basically, we all have these biases. If you remember something that you think is correct, it subconsciously can influence your ability to predict the future about what's going to happen next. Even if the root information, you're not sure if it's correct or not correct, if you recall it very vividly, sometimes it can influence your behavior. Mathematical anxiety, on the other hand, is a feeling of apprehension or fear when faced with mathematical tasks. It can stem from a variety of factors, including past negative experiences with math, societal pressure to perform academically, or simply a lack of confidence in one's abilities. Whatever the cause, mathematical anxiety can significantly impair a person's ability to perform mental calculations, even if they have the necessary skills. Everybody feels this, even me. Now, I run a website where I've helped many, many, many Hundreds of thousands of people do better at math, right? So I think I'm pretty good at teaching. However, most people think I was always really good at math. Here's the truth. I was a terrible math student in sixth and seventh grade. It started to turn around a little bit in eighth grade, but by ninth grade, I started to get my footing and do well in math. But in sixth and seventh grade, it was terrible. And I think I had a pretty bad case of mathematical anxiety. I remember taking exams and being terrified that even though I kind of knew what to do, I didn't know how to start. I didn't know what to write down first. And I just felt this overwhelming, like this weight on my shoulders that I couldn't even get started. I don't know how to solve that for everybody, but for me, the way that I solved it is by practice, by forcing myself to do a ton of problems over and over and over again, so that on the exam, I knew what I should start doing because I did it so many times before. Just like when you play ball, you practice and you kind of know what to do because you practice so much. And so that's how I teach math, by doing problems, starting with the easy problems, building and going to the hard problems, mostly to build your confidence so the mathematical anxiety, we can keep it over in the corner. Now let's talk about some strategies for improving everybody's mental math skills. What can we do to sharpen our mental math skills and to overcome the fuzziness that plagues so many of us? So there are several strategies that can help. One approach is to practice mental math regularly, starting with simple calculations and gradually increasing the difficulty over time. Now, by challenging our brains to perform calculations without the aid of calculators, we can strengthen the neural pathways associated with numerical reasoning and overall improve our proficiency. Another very helpful strategy is to break down complex problems into smaller, manageable components. By breaking a problem down into its constituent parts, we can simplify the calculation process and reduce the cognitive load in our brains. And this makes it much, much easier to arrive at the correct answer. Additionally, techniques such as visualization and estimation can be valuable tools for improving mental math skills. By visualizing numerical relationships and making educated guesses about the size of a solution, we can very often arrive at a rough estimate that's sufficient for most and many practical purposes. So basically the bottom line is step number one is you really have to integrate mental math into your everyday life. If you're at the grocery store and you see uh, the prices of various objects, try to add them up in your head. You are going to fail at the beginning. 
You are, but as you practice more, maybe with easier and easier numbers in the beginning, you will begin to get a sense of how to do this much more rapidly and it will become natural to you. And to expand a little bit on the second tip, estimation, so important. If I have a pack of gum for $1.99 and a packet of balloons for $3.75, just round those up to the nearest dollar and then you know roughly how many dollars it's going to be. And then you can refine the calculation over time if you need that extra accuracy. But even just rounding up and adding mentally, don't try to add $1.99 to $1.99 to $1.99. Just add two and two and two and you know, you'll get six. But as you get more experience with more numbers holding them in your head, it's a skill that will get better over time. Let me share with you something I uh, used a long time ago and I still use it today. The numbers zero through 10 are the most important numbers in our number system, right? It's a base 10 number system. And they go in pairs, right? The number zero, I want you to think of having a pair or a partner, which is a number 10. Because when you add zero and 10, you get 10 back, right? The number one is paired up with the number nine because one plus nine is 10. They're partners. I want you to think of them as partner numbers. Two goes with eight, three goes with seven, four goes with six, five goes with five. And then once you memorize those, then you, you, you go, it, basically everything starts over again. Six goes with four, and then seven goes with three, and so on. And so those are the most important numbers. Because obviously, if you see three plus seven, you know right away it's 10. If you see four plus six, you know right away it's 10. But it also helps for larger numbers. For instance, what if you have 13 plus 17? So what you know is that the three and the seven go together, that makes 10. And then you have another 10 from the 13 and another 10 from the 17. So it's 10 plus 10 plus 10, which is 30. By recognizing the three and the seven going together, making 10, putting that aside and then adding the other tens, you can rapidly get to the, to the correct answer. Let's start with some good problems here. Let's talk about adding together 13 plus 34. First of all, start with the larger number first. That's just gonna make it much easier. So you have to hold the number 34 in your mind. You have to hold that in your mind and you wanna add 13. But don't try to add 13 as a block. That makes it hard. Instead, you break up the 13 as 10 and three more. 10 plus three is 13, of course. So you start with 34 and you add 10 in your mind. 34 means 10 more is 44. You hold 44 in your mind. Now you have the three left over, so then you add three more, which is 47. So what you do is you start with 34, and then 10 more is 44, and then you end up at 47. So in your mind, you're just simply saying 34, 44, 47. That's how you add numbers. You start with units of 10, and then you add whatever is left over. Let's take another problem. What about 18 plus 54? Again, start with the larger number, it's easier. So 54. Now you have to add 18, but don't add 18 as a block, that's just hard. Add 10 first. So 54, 10 more becomes 64. All right, 64. Now I have to add the remaining eight, but I'm not gonna add the eight all together. What I'm here is at 64. I know because four and six go together, I know that six more is gonna bring me to 70. And then two more beyond that will take me to 72. So in my mind, I start with 54, and then 10 more is 64, and then go to 70, because that's easy to add the six, and then two more is 72. So you say the numbers, 54, 64, then 70, then 72. So stop trying to add it all in one chunk, and it's much easier, and this can get easier with practice. And by the way, now you know why it's so hard to go in reverse. If you start with 18 in your mind and try to add the 54, you can do it, but you have a lot more numbers to keep track of. All right, here's our next problem. 27 plus 27. So it's the same number, so you start with 27 in your mind. Don't try to add 27 to it, that's too big. You break it up. It's 10 plus 10 more plus seven more. That's what 27 is. So we start with 27, 10 more is 37, then 10 more is 47, and then what do I have? Well, to get to 47 to 50 is only three. So now I'm at 50, but I have four more to get to my total of seven left over, so I'll be at 54. So I start at 27, then 37, then 47, then 50, and then I need four more, that's gonna be 54. Now you see why I taught you in the beginning to know what numbers pair up. Because when I was at 47, I know that seven plus three gets me to another increment of 10, which is 50, and then I can just add the remaining left, which brings me to 54. 
Now here's our last one. Let's say we have 37 plus 52. Again, start with the larger number, 52. Don't add 37. What you want to do is you're going to add 10 plus 10 plus 10, that's 30, and then you'll add the 7. So we start with 52 in our mind. 10 more is 62. 10 more is 72. 10 more is 82. All right, so I'm at 82. Now what do I have to do? I have to add the remaining 7 that's left over. And then I know that 2 plus 7 is 9, so it's 89. So in my mind, I say, okay, start with 52, then it's going to be 62, then 72, then 82, then 89. That's much easier than trying to add large numbers together. I'm telling you, this is very powerful, and it also works for subtraction. Instead of obviously adding, you go backwards by 10, and 10, and 10, and then you keep on continuing with the subtraction. If you have decimals, you can add the, the money or the decimals together, ignoring the decimal point, and then put the decimal point in your final answer. So it's good for money, it's good for addition, subtraction, very, very powerful. So to wrap it all up, the decline of mental math skills in the age of technology is a multifaceted phenomenon with roots in both evolutionary biology and cognitive psychology, bunch of big words that basically means that the rise of computational devices have undoubtedly made our lives easier, but also led to a gradual erosion of our capability to do mental math because we get reliant on technology. But if we understand the factors that contribute to the decline and we implement strategies to combat them mostly by practicing, we can reclaim our abilities with numbers and we can banish that fuzziness that plagues our mathematical minds. So the next time you find yourself reaching for your phone or a calculator to calculate a tip, take a moment to pause and flex those mental math muscles instead. Who knows, you might just surprise yourself with what you're capable of. Before we wrap up for good, I'll share with you the easiest way to calculate tips because we're doing that constantly when we go out, all right? Let's say your bill is $20, two zero, $20. 10% of $20, all you do is move the decimal point from 20 one spot over, so the 10% tip is $2. But what if you don't wanna leave 10% tip? What if you wanna leave 20% tip? So what you do is you calculate the 10%, which is $2, and then you double it to get you to the 20%, so $4. So 10% tip on $20 bill, that's gonna be $2. And for a 20% tip, you just double it to $4. But wait a minute, what if you don't want to give a 20% tip? What if you want 15? Well, that's right in the middle. 10% is $2, and 20% is $4. So 15%, what do you think it is? It's $3. So that is the fastest way to calculate tips. And even though there might be decimals in there, like maybe your bill isn't uh, you know, uh, $20, maybe it's $19.56. You know what I do? I just round it up to $20 in my mind, and I say, okay, that's $2. 15% uh, is $3, and, or 20% is $4, or whatever, and I round up and do it. That's much, much faster and better for you than to grab a calculator and get the exact number because that way you can flex your math and mental math skills and get better every day. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thanks for hanging out with me. And until next time, keep crunching those numbers and stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.